The people of Lebanon are creating grassroots systems to help each other survive and to keep their capital city functioning. The explosions of August 4th, 2020 reportedly killed hundreds, injured thousands, left many more missing, and displaced hundreds of thousands from their homes. In the days since the horrific event, Lebanon has also seen daily protests and violent clashes between civilians and police. The Lebanese government declared a state of emergency, and the FBI said they would come in to help with some of the several investigations that had been announced since the blast. But no one really knows how long it will take to rebuild Beirut to its former glory. So we compiled some information about what happened, how we got here, and what we know so far. It was like something that I've never seen in my life. It's horrible. All of Beirut, a certain district in Beirut is completely collapsed. Hospitals are full, people are sleeping on the streets. It's horrible. As a Lebanese, I couldn't help but, you know, in a moment like this where you hear that explosion sound, I thought maybe the war broke again. <laughs> Initially, there was a lot of speculation about the origins of the blast, but soon Lebanese officials claimed to know the cause. Just hours after the blast, Major General Abbas Ibrahim of Lebanon's General Security Directorate said that he believed the blast had been caused by highly explosive materials. It was later confirmed that the root of the explosions had been several thousand tons of ammonium nitrate that had been stored at the city's port for several years. The stock of explosives had had minimal supervision. In the days that followed, rescue efforts continued and the death toll began to rise. We focused on what people in Beirut were going through and how they were organizing support systems for those around them. When somebody needs help, you just help without expecting anything in return and uh, without thinking of uh, what will happen tomorrow. Everything you see now on Twitter from Lebanese people are all personal initiatives. They, they don't have anything to do with the government. Or uh, people are uh, are giving up their shelters, their homes, their uh, their food, their money, even uh, transportation, everything. They are trying to help each other from a personal initiative, which should be the the responsibility of the government. I started seeing videos of the people houses shattered. These people were in need of help, and, and there is no one that was going to lend a hand. I directly initiated that if anyone needs a room, like if anyone needs help, direct help, if someone don't know where to go and where he's going to sleep tonight, I'm here to help. But it's important to know that this happened when Lebanon was already experiencing a large economic crisis, on top of growing numbers of COVID-19 cases. We talked to Human Rights Watch researcher Aya Majzoub, but the compounding difficulties people in Lebanon were facing. Human Rights Watch is an international organization that investigates human rights abuses around the world and tries to hold governments accountable for those abuses. We found that the hospital sector really was in crisis due to the financial crisis in the country. And the reasons were that first, the government was failing to pay the dues that it owes hospitals. So at that time, it owed private hospitals an estimated $1.3 billion in accrued bills since 
2011. This was obviously impacting the ability of hospitals to pay for their staff, to pay for doctors, nurses, medicines, medical equipment. You had the economic crisis, which was caused by the dollar shortage in the country. And as the dollars increasingly became scarce in Lebanon, the value of the Lebanese pound depreciated rapidly. This placed a huge burden on importers who were struggling to come up with the dollars necessary to be able to purchase medical supplies and equipment. And Lebanon imports almost all of the medical supplies and equipment that it uses. And you know, due to this dollar shortage, uh, medical importers told us that they were running out of vital equipment like blood bags, uh, kidney uh, dialysis filters, um, heart stands, catheters, and they were warning that we might start seeing people going to hospital and dying because uh, doctors just didn't have the right equipment to deal with uh, the emerging medical needs. Two hospitals were com you know, completely destroyed by the blast. I was at one of those hospitals and saw medical teams evacuating patients, uh, uh, doctors and nurses from a building that had completely collapsed. Um, there was no electricity in the building anymore, so nurses and doctors were having to take out patients to the, to the parking lot and treat people in the parking lot using their mobile phones for light. By August 6, funerals around the country were beginning to take place. And we looked at some of the stories of the people that had been lost in the blasts, as well as those that had remained missing. Grief quickly turned to anger as more information about the blast began to emerge. And thousands of people took to the streets to demand justice from the government for what many were now calling criminal negligence. أنا ماني مسؤول ما بعرف وين محطوطة ولا بعرف شو درجة الخطورة
Macron est là pour vous aider en tant que peuple, pour vous apporter les médicaments, le soutien, de quoi vous nourrir et de quoi vous... Capture Beirut Stand up on all the bodies On the front This is... Emmanuel Macron, who came to the front of the front of Daily protests calling for the removal of the country's ruling class continued. And six days after the explosions, the Prime Minister and his cabinet announced they would officially step down. But the resignations left us with more questions than answers. If the removal of ruling parties was what protesters wanted, why did protests continue? What did these resignations really mean? And how would the country rebuild without large parts of its government? We reached out to Lebanese political scientist Jamil Mouad to learn more about the context of the resignations and find out if he had an idea of what protesters wanted. Of course we need to get rid of this ruling class. But way more important is to, conv is to claim back the state. If you fail, you should say why you did fail. And this is something that wasn't said yesterday when the Prime Minister uh, 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 resigned. He said they didn't let me work, they're corrupt, etc. But he didn't name anyone as if he's absolving himself from any responsibility and absolving the elite from their responsibility. We always talk about someone who's responsible. We never name this person who should be responsible. During the war, we have kind of a territorial disintegration and on each and every part we have a militia. They were governing the society, uh, whether by collecting direct taxes or even offering, you know, security for those uh, uh, citizens who live uh, in these areas. So just after the war, uh, um, was the declaration of what we call the Taif Agreement, which is an agreement uh, signed in order to put an official end to the civil war. Uh, we didn't have any kind of accountability. So the Lebanese society suffered greatly from the lack of accountability. And therefore, the same warlords, the same militia uh, leaders, they became uh, overnight the politicians, the ministers, and the leaders of this country. So the same way they were operating when they were heads of militia, offering services, offering security in return, is the same way they were running, you know, state institution. They were completely immune. They absolved themselves from their responsibilities towards civilians the war, and they say, now we're clean, we're gonna go about you know, our life and be the politicians and ministers, etc., etc. So that's why currently accountability is very, very important. This accountability that we didn't, we didn't have in the 90s, that's why we should now call for accountability and render them accountable for the crime they did commit in Beirut. The political future of the country is still unknown. But we'll continue to watch this story to see if any political alternatives to the current system arise and to watch how Lebanese civilians and organizations continue to support each other on the ground.